And you don't have the. So you don't have. Yeah. You have everything. Okay. Okay. Cool. Cool. Uh, let's get started. So today we are going to continue with the application of uh, uh, our previous, the topics that we discussed previously on uh, machine uh, on uh, deep learning and graphical model. And if we had time, we're going to switch here to Gaussian process. Yeah. Okay. So first, let's the review what we have learned in the last lecture. So in the last, last time, we talked about the uh, conditional random fields combined with uh, deep learning for semantic segment segmentation. The problem here is that we, we need to consider the spatial relationships between the pixel levels. And we want to incorporate a random field, a specific graphical structure to the problem. So the model can, contains the similarity between the locations of the pixels and also the uh, pixel values of features. So basically, it's combined of two kernels. And to do inference, because of the, because of the uh, local structure of the, these Gaussian kernels, you can efficiently do the inference using a mean field approximation and also so this you feel the message passing by doing convolution because of the local locality of the Gaussian kernels. And finally, we give some, we find that the results are improved by incorporating this graph structure to the uh, user deep learning or deep convolution neural networks. Okay, so the results. Basically, it's much better if you use a combine a neural network with the graphic structure. So today, I'm going to talk about another application of the graphic model, which is also the, called deep graphic model. This task task is called image to image translation. So basically, the problem is to transform one image or one style to another style. So for example, here, we can transform the labels to the image. So we are given a label map, or this is a segmentation map, mask of the, of the scene. And then we can generate an image from these labels. Also, we can change the a color. So if you have a grayscale image, we can generate a color, color image from the grayscale image. Can I show the pointer? OK, so there are some other styles we can transfer. For example, from ages to photo, and to, from day to night, and from a horse to a zebra. So you can see the animation here. You, know, you can do this in a video by transforming a horse to a zebra. So how the idea of this work is inspired by the, the GAN, so what we have learned last time. So here, we want to extend the um, standard GAN model to a conditional setting, because the data we have is a uh, pair data. So by pair, we mean that we have two random variables, x and y. x represents the image of one uh, type, and y is the image of another type. So every time we are given the data with the paired x and y. So this seems like a standard regression problem, right? So the input is a multidimensional vector, and the output is also a multidimensional vector. So the standard way to do this regression is to find a function from x to y by minimizing the error one or or error two error between the output and the ground truth y. So you can consider it as a linear regression or nonlinear regression. So here g is a function which maps x to y. 
But what's the problem with, uh, with this traditional regression framework? So here, because output is not a, a single value, a single scalar. So in a traditional regression, we only have, uh, we usually have a one-dimensional output y. So here, the output is a multi-dimensional y, which contains some rich structures in the, between the, each element of y. So the output is the image. If you use the standard regression loss, like L1 or L2, you will get blurred images out of this framework. So basically, when you transform, when you use L1, L2, you know that we are assume a, a Gaussian noise on the regression model, right? So why is, so that there's a noise between the predicted value and the ground truth value. So you say it's not valid in this case because the output content actually lies in the manifold, so the image, image manifold. So if you use this kind of loss, L2 loss, you will get an average over this image space. You know that the average of two images shifted by a small value might produce the not a valid image or a blurred image in this case. So the idea to alleviate, alleviate this problem is to using the conditional gain structure. So here, by conditional gain, we mean that, okay, so in a traditional gain, we have the noise, a random noise, a Gaussian noise as input, and the image as output. So here, the input can be a, also can be an image, and the output is also an image. So here we transform the edge image to, to the real image. And by, since we have paired data, so in the real side, the real data contains the pairs of X and Y values. So in the left, right side, we have the data combined of X and Y pairs. So this is different from GAN because in GAN, we only have the Y, but not X. So we are comparing the fake data. So the fake data in GAN is just an image, but the fake data in conditional GAN is a pair of input and output. So by doing this, by matching the condition, the joint distribution of X and the generated, generated image GX to the real pair X and Y, we can learn the conditional transformation between X and Y. So, do you have any questions regarding this? Somebody, we can, we can review that if people don't remember the information. Okay, so review the condition. <laughs> so uh, I cannot use the whiteboard. Um, yeah, okay. I'll show the box. So if you escape, then you can use this. If anybody wants to switch, let me know. So let's first review the GAN model. Hmm? Not working? Yeah, it's working. Just, just try this. Now try. All right. Cool. So in the GAN model, we have a generator or a function represented by a neural network. And the input is some noise distribution, which usually a Gaussian distribution. So it's a canonical distribution. Output is x. x could be images. And we have data. The data we have is empirical distribution of x. So we have some images, which we can learn an empirical distribution of x. So the input is, you can consider input as a canonical distribution, and the output is a complicated real 
distribution. And we learn the generator by matching the distribution of G, E, and the distribution of X. So we, we learn this by minimizing a di distance between these two distributions. So the, this is the real <coughs> data distribution, and this is the generated X. So it's G of E is X hat, so this is a generated image. We're minimizing the dis distribution difference between these two distributions. Okay, so for condition again, we have another input. We're gonna have E here. Because here we want to model the conditional distribution from x to y. We have x as input, so we have x additional input x. And output is y. So this does a similar thing as GAT because the input just distribution, noise distribution, and also x distribution. So here the G represents the transformation from X and noise to Y. So this represents this conditional distribution, right? So if you this is equivalent in the sense that it's equivalent to Y is a function of X and noise. This is a functional model. They are equivalent in some sense. And to learn this model, we have the data we have is y and x, the joint distribution of x, y and x. So this is what we have in the data. Of course, it's an empirical distribution because we don't have the true distribution, but we have the data, the pair of data. And also, from the model, we can concact the input and out output to this y hat, x hat. So this is our generated data. So each time we generate a pair of x and a y data. So the distribution is p, x, and y hat. And here, similarly to GAN, we are minimizing the difference between the generated joint distribution and the real joint distribution. So we just, OK. Why do you also generate x? Oh, x is not generated. x is the original input. It's just a yeah, it's got just a copy of X. Yeah. Okay. So the final distribution, why do you need to incorporate X into the distribution? Just additional, uh, like there are really three data counts, so not random, right? So you don't model the distribution of X. Yeah, we don't model the distribution of X. So here you can also consider that you are matching the conditional distribution. But you, you imagine the joint distribution is the same because you have the data. You have the joint, you have these two distribution, right? You have, yeah. Let, let me clarify on that. I think that's a good question that uh, throws out many confusion. Um, so in, in classical GAN, so we have a generator that accepts a noise and generates some sort of the data that is fake data, which is supposed to be as similar as, as the real data. So, the, the way that it works is that you have a generator that accepts a noise and generates something. But then to distinguish it, you have this fake data, let's call it x hat. And you have a classifier that says that, is it fake or is it real? So that's a classical GAN. So the conditional GAN, so you provide epsilon, which is your noise. You provide your x, which is, as you said, like similar to CR that you use as a, as a, as a constant. But the thing is that when you are building a classifier, the classifier has access to the fake data, which is this function here, x, y hat. But it also has access to the input as well. So you can think of it as a, as a classifier that, that the classifier has access to you, whatever you have generated and whatever you have provided input, the concatenation of both. So the only difference between them is that the generator of the conditional GAN get epsilon and x, and the discriminator of the conditional GAN get the fake data and X. That's it. Yeah. In some sense, we are both conditioning the generator as well as the discriminator of the generator. Yeah, so the discriminator get access to the information that you have provided to the generator. 
Yeah, so this can help you learn the conditional distribution. Because here you have, in real data, you have these data pairs. If you only use y but not use x, so here you will have, have many solutions because you only have two marginal distribution, right? So for example, in GAN, here g is not unique. So you can have arbitrary solutions. Since it, as long as you can generate the uh, distribution of x. But here, with x and y pairs, so this conditional is more identifiable in some sense. So here we use the conditional GAN to learn the transformation from X to Y. So here, the first loss is a conditional GAN loss. And here, uh, the difference is that in the discriminator, we use both X and Y as, as the input to the classifier. And also in the generator, we have additional input X. Now here also we can also combine the loss with the traditional regression loss to get a trade-off between these two losses. You can see compared to GAN, so this is conditional and this is GAN. And we don't have the X as input. OK, so here, because the input also contains the image, it's not just a random vector. So we, we need to use some more advanced the structure to do this transformation for the generator. So in generator, usually the input is the image and output is also image. So we use some kind of encoder-decoder network. So by encoder-decoder, it means we we'll first do some convolutional, so standard feed-forward convolutional network to reduce the spatial resolution of the image. So finally, it can become a vector. Is that just so that it doesn't memorize the input x's exactly? Is that why you have it go down to the smaller, like an encoder, another encoder, and you have the input? Yeah, so the transformation between two images, you can consider the input and output are all multi dimensional vectors, right? It's very high dimensional. So here we use something called information botnet, so we compress the image to some low dimensional represent, representation, so you extract the useful informa information and then expand this information to a, another image. Yeah, but I mean, you're not using that lower dimensional representation anymore, right? Because you just spit out the reconstructed image, right? So the, the purpose is so that, I think you were talking about this, is that you use the bottleneck so that it doesn't memorize yeah, yeah. X, right? Yes. Okay. But it also reduces dimension. It's a part of this significant, yeah, because, yes, because otherwise if you use MLP, it's going to be number of pixels by number of pi yeah, number yeah. of pixels multiplied by whatever layer, intermediate layers that you have to check again. While yeah. here you have a bunch of filters, which is like kind of 3 by 3 or 5 by 5, whatever that is. And it's so it's a specific convolutional structure for images. So it's not a general structure, but for images, this usually gives you much better performance. And you can see here, the standard autoencoder, so standard encoder decoder network and gives you a blur image. So this is also not good because in a convolutional process, you reduce the dimension and you lose too much information. So this can be partially alleviated by concat concatenating the previous layers to the uh, decoder layers. So you can see the, some connection between the, the, the first layer and the second layer to the corresponding layers in the decoder. So in the encoder, this could pre preserve more, much more information and gives you a more realistic image. And also, the, yeah. 
Oh, this connection we just uh, copy the features in the previous com uh, encoder network. So here, if you don't have these connections, you are only using the output of the convolutional encoder. So, so operation. Yeah. Oh, you just because the, they are the same resolution, right? So you can find the corresponding layer which has the same resolution. You can just concatenate the features. But before that, you can apply a dimension reduction to reduce the feature map, the dimension, the numbers of the feature channels before the adding them together. So here, in a, in a link, you can add another encoder, so which reduces the dimensionality of the feature map. So there's an overall compression, and then there's a compression for each of those bridges. Yeah, yeah, yes. And the discriminator is just a standard discriminator. It's a, so for images, we also use the standard fit forward and convolution network. So here, it's not very reasonable to use the MLP. It's the same thing for images. Here are some results from this conditional GAN. So by using the conditional GAN, we can generate very realistic images, which looks very nice. Some of them are even nicer than the grand truth, right? Also, here is the input from the segmentation labels to the images. Of course, the results is not unique, as you know. It's uh, so the the results are usually similar to the grand truth, but it's not exactly the same. Resolution? Yeah. You mean image? Uh, it does not have a fixed resolution. But how good is it if you zoom in? Would it be much more blurry than the generated image versus the, the true image? Well, like it looks nice at this resolution, but it doesn't fall apart if you zoom in twice. Oh, or? okay, yeah. If you look at the details, there are some difference. So it's not as smooth as the ground truth image. <laughs> The it's not as sharp. It's sharp, but sometimes it's too sharp. So it. Have like artifacts or yeah, artifacts. artifacts. Yes, Fixed artifacts. Solution. Yeah, yeah. But here, at this resolution, you cannot see the artifacts. Right? Could you actually zoom in on these images, or are these already downsampled to the same resolution? Oh, these are already downsampled. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is. I, I still wonder what is the output uh, of the neural net's size in terms of pixels because. When I've done try, try training neural nets with big computer outputs, and it takes um, a ridiculous time. So I'm wondering if this is like a two megapixel picture, or like just like like I don't know hundred. It's something times. like a like a five hundred by seven hundred okay. so image size. But you you are using a convolutional structure, so if you have a good GPU, this size does not matter that much. So finally. So the convolution structure just takes the original size to just do the convolution. It doesn't matter which the, the size your image has, right? Well, like, um, the, 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 the larger, like, I think the, the order will increase quadratically the size of the image. Yeah, yeah. So that's... But it's just doing the convolution in a big image. So the parameters are also the same. With yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, that's another problem, yes. I mean, that's one thing, but also like, I'm saying that the convolution would take quadratic time because you have two dimensions, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Or uh, a trick they use is that they can break the image to some uh, patches or large patches. So you're not doing over the whole image, but doing a sub image, sub region of the image. And then put them together. Do you think the strategy is the another question relevant to this. Um, there is a concept called super resolution. And I, I heard the idea, it was not mine, was to, to take a few different, like taking a lower resolution image and basically to see if you can generate a, 
yeah. high resolution image. Then is is this the, similar? Did, did anybody did this? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it was actually it was did before this kind of work. Oh, for, wow. for, so after the game was out, so somebody has already did this done this job because it also fits into the conditional GAN framework. And also, if you have like texture regions, if you use L1 or L2 norm to do the regression, you will get a smooth the output. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so here are some additional results from day to night. OK. So here we have the pair data to learn the conditional distribution. But what if we have unpaired data? So here we only have images from one type or one domain, x, and images from another domain. We don't have the pair data. So we don't have the same image of the two type. Mathematically, we, here we only have two marginal distribution, x and y. But we want to learn the conditional distribution y given x. So theoretically, this, there are infinite solutions to this problem, right? Just as the uh, traditional GAN. So idea is that so it seems that we can just apply the GAN to this problem. And we can treat x as noise and y as the output. Then we can learn a generator from x to y by using uh, adversity training in GAN. And also, in the same way, you can transform Y to X by another generator F. So as I said, the problem is that the solutions to this is solution space is too large. So in GAN, it doesn't matter because you only want to generate the image. You don't care about what the function really like. But here, because finally you are going to transform the image to another style, so it's better to preserve some information in the original image. So the idea of circle gun is to train the generator from X to Y and the generator from Y to X simultaneously. And also with some additional constraints. So here you, you know that we have two GANs, right, running from X y and y to x. So if you look at this image, horse image from to, uh, to zebra, so which one do you think is uh, the best one, which should be transformed to the image in the right side? Yeah, the middle one. So why is the middle one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So because the change between these two images is very relatively small. So this is called model class because you don't have the pair of data. So any data, theoretically any image can be transformed to the image on the right side, right? Because you only have the unpaired data. So here, we want to add another constraint. So, add a, so it's because we want to the reconstruction. No, not the. Re, okay. It's because the change between the two images is it's better to be small. So the change is small. So that means we can better reconstruct the image from the transform the image, right? So we transform image x to y, and then we can also easily re reconstruct the original x from y. So this is, here we add another reconstruction error to the traditional gain. And also, in the other side, so here we just want to reconstruct the original input. So 
So you can see that if you want to reconstruct the first image on the left side, it's much more difficult. <coughs> this has a small cycle loss or small reconstruction loss. And this one, these two have large cycle loss. Similarly, we can do this in a, another direction from Y to X. So we finally, we are Train these two GAN together with two cycle loss. If you look at the objective function, it's just a combination of the GAN loss and two reconstruction loss or two autoencoder. So basically, the combination of GAN and autoencoder. But this autoencoder plays a very important role because it can helps you to reduce the solution space and get more reasonable results. But you know, theoretically, this is not guaranteed because even if you add this constraint, the solution is still not unique, right? So here are some results generated from adding this cycle loss. You can see if this is a season change. Of course, you can see the change is relatively small, so it's changed. If the change is very large, usually it's very difficult in this unpaired case. And from winter to summer. Also, you can see some failure cases of this algorithm. So if you look at these images, you can see that usually this algorithm fails because the output is too similar to the original input. So it fails to transform the image to another domain. For example, in apple to orange, although the color changes to the orange from red to orange, the shape still has the same shape as the apple. So this is due to the fact that we introduced the reconstruction loss in the gain loss. So because of this rec reconstruction, we cannot transform the images to another domain which has a very significant change or, or large change between these two domains. So usually, so this, this says that if we have a large change between these two domains of image, we cannot only rely on unpaired data to learn this transformation. But with small changes, by re introducing the reconstruction loss, you can actually do a good job in this case. Okay. Do we have a talk about? Okay. So basically, a similar idea. A work called Copper Gun was proposed to address the problem. So here, in um, this also works in an unparalleled situation. So we don't have unparalleled data. So as I have said, the change could, should be small across domains. So if we use the generative model to model these two domains, so here we have a common space, this space, which may have a, a Gaussian distribution or other distribution. And we can transform this Gaussian distribution by two generators, G1 and G2, to the two image domains. And if you can constrain the G1 and G2, so if G1 and G2 are the same, they are going to generate the same type of, type of image. And if you can constrain some, the change, the difference between G1 and G2, you can actually regularize your training training process, right? So, do you understand this basic idea? G, the generators on your own, not what you're saying, like share weights between G1 and G2 or something? Yeah, yeah, similar, yeah. The share latency, so it's like uh, similar to, let's say, CCA. Yeah. There is a latent space that generates 
domain one and domain two. Each of those goes to their own generator, but there's a latent space that they're all in for. Now, if you want to do cycle again, you want to go from X1 back to Z, and from Z to the end. And that's not something that you can use yet. Because from GAN, you can only go from Z, which is your, let's say, noise space or code space, to X, but you cannot go back. Yeah. And that's the problem. So here, you can easily use this model to model the changes between the two domains by constraining the generator. But our goal is to do image translation, right? So we can, here we can train these two GANs, G1 and G2 together, with some constraints on the G1 and G2. But finally, we are going to transform X1 to X2. So in this framework, if we want to do, so here the sharing is, as you said, just some sharing between the layers, specific layers. So you can share G1, G2 by setting the layers to be the same weights and learn them together. Now the problem is that finally we are going to go from X1 to X2. And in this model, we have to first go from X1 to Z, and then from Z to X2. Similarly, we can, in other direction, we should go to go from X2 to Z and then to X1. So to achieve this, we have to combine a lot of, so basically it's VAE. So you know in VAE, you have a way to do the inference or to infer Z from X. So the model is like this. So here we have two inputs, x1 and x2. We do an encoder. We encode them to a latent space. And then we can use two different generators to generate the image of the two domain. So if you look at the first G e1 and g1, it's a standard VAE. So we can do, if you only consider x from x1 to the this space and then back to x1 is a VAE, right? So it goes to the latent space and then reconstruct itself. And by, by combining the VAE inference part and the GAN generator part, so it's E1 and G2, this actually does the image translation job. So the first one, the E1 is the VAE of the first VAE, and G2 is the generator of the second gun. So notice that we have we have E1 and G1 for the first image domain, and E2 and G2 for the top second second image domain. And also here, the G1 can be trained using a standard gun. So in the first domain. We have G1 and D1. So G is the generator and D is the discriminator. And if you consider these three together, it's called a VAE GAN. So different between VAE GAN and VAE that. So in VAE, we use the decoder to as the loss function to learn the or decoder and the L2 loss to learn the generator, right? You remember the loss function of VAE? It contains a reconstruction error and a regularization of the posterior. So the problem with VAE is that if you use that reconstruction error to learn the then G, G1, it all usually produce the blurry images. So here, we use GAN to train the G, generator G, but the inference part, so the inference is still the VAE inference algorithm. The difference is that in VAE, if you remember, you need to maximize the elbow, and one of the ways to use elbow is that the construction error minus a regularizer. Minus a regularizer. And the regularizer was supposed to uh, minimize the distance between code space and your posterior space. So that was what it was. But the reconstruction was, at the end of the day, was like the formation of the normal. So it boils down to L2 loss. So what he's saying is that, so these, you can, you can view in the same way, but you, have, you still have the same thing. So you still have to do the generation that's sample coming from the decoder. 
and the discriminator and the construction of except that here is using the, the discriminator to distinguish between fake and real data and does a result of the bad uh, uh, reconstruction or blue result that we see. Yeah. And finally, if you look at both sides, it's a couple of gap. So this framework combines, I think, it's almost all the models, right? It's VAE GAN, VAE GAN, and couple GAN. By doing this, you can transform the image from X1 to X2 or from X2 to X1. Also, with a constraint on the generator G1 and G2 so by sharing some layers. So, this produces re really good results. For example, here you can change between the sunny days to rainy days, and from summer to winter, and from real image to synthetic computer graphic images. And also, you can change. Uh, transfer between some dogs, like these are images from the ImageNet. So these dogs look similar, but they are actually different. But you can transform one dog species to another. And also the, the cat and tiger. And finally, you can also transform the image of human face to different attributes. So for example, the you can transform the hair color, eyeglasses, with or without eyeglasses, goatee, and smiling or not smiling. But here we don't, so this algorithm does not rely on any paired data. So it's totally unpaired. Okay, I will stop here. Okay. All right, so. So this basically concludes this module, so in the remaining time I want to use this time to talk about uh, Gaussian process. Oops, too far. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to switch here and talk about the Gaussian process uh, and uh, start a new module. I have to say that, uh, so as you see, um, the, the homework basically ends at variation autoencoder. So we won't going to ask you, uh, you're not going to have any homework on GAN or application of the GAN. And also, all of these uh, materials we are, that we are going to cover from this point on won't be in, in any of your homework. Your last homework is going to be mostly uh, general questions, so no implementation about your understanding, and we hope that you can focus on your project. So, uh, so let's get a start on the last module of the class that uh, we are going to talk about non-parametric approaches. Uh, depending time, how much uh, time permits, I'm going to talk about Gaussian process. And if uh, uh, if we had more time, I'm going to give you uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, DP, determinant of point process. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, Dirichlet process, not determinant. All right, so let's get get started. One of the main goals of um, many of these problems that we see in this class was uh, reconstructing some kind of function. So this function, for example, can be for the purpose of regression or for, for the purpose of the classification. And a very general setting is that you are given some input-output pairs. So this input-output pair can be as simple as uh, a vector of couple of dimension and the target, which is the classification. Or as we saw in a previous example, it can be as complicated as a pair of things. But at the end of the day, it boils down to uh, reconstructing some function that you can use it later on for prediction. So why not um, uh, defining some probability distribution in space of function? So that's what the name of the process is coming from. So you can think of a random process as a, 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 as a, as a mathematical object that every time that you draw a sample from it, it gives you a function. So unlike, for example, what you see um, uh, let's say normal distribution that if you every time that you draw a sample from it is going to be a multi-dimensional vector every draw from a process is going to be a, a function 
So how we are going to do and uh, work with this mathematical object? Of course, it has many applications. Like the very obvious application of that is regression and classification. Given an input, I want to predict the label of the class, uh, label of the sample, or I want to predict, uh, let's say, uh, in, in, the, in the context of robotics, I want to see how much torque I need given the state, or um, the label of the, the, the face, I want to see um, uh, if there is a fraud or not. So that you can think of it like many, the regression classification is probably the most classical things that you can think about. So, um, so let's start with, with the data. So let's say somebody has given you this data set and it says that this is the number of the airline passengers over time. And, um, and you see this pattern. So it's very simple. Uh, and the uh, representation of the data is a year versus the number of passengers per year. And he or she is going to ask you that, well, this is the data set from 1949 to 19. Uh, 57 so what do you think can you extrapolate the behavior of the market on a, on a year 1961 um, so there are several ways that you can view this data set so you can say that well it seems to me that there's a there's a, uh, there's a trend that things are going up um, so maybe one way of modeling is that like, view that as one single line that goes up. So I, I can expect a higher trend. Or maybe I have some extra information about this market, and I don't know, there, there are more uh, uh, airplane crashing at that year, and I do expect things to go down. Uh, if I view it with more care, I see that maybe the line is not a good pattern to predict the behavior of the passengers. So, so it seems that the things are going up and down. And you know it makes sense because there are season there are seasonal behavior into this. So people traveling, let's say in summer more than they travel in the winter because there are more vacations. That boils down to uh, what kind of function I have to use to to predict the behavior of the customers for this data set. So how complicated my function should be to, to fit this data set. And uh, one way of viewing that is that if I want to view, if I view, want to view this as a, as, a, as a prediction, I have to come up with a function. How complicated that function should be. And, uh, and this is basically the topic that we are going to discuss uh, uh, in, in, this, uh, in this class and in, in the following class. That if, for example, I've given this data set, a simple fit to that would be a linear function. But maybe that's not explaining everything. If, if I fit something too complex, I might be, uh, so for example, let's say instead of uh, polynomial of order one, if I use polynomial of higher order, I may uh, predict something that is not as realistic. So one of the things that we have to incorporate is that we want to model this data set as a function, but we should have a measure of complexity of this function. So what is this non-parametric approach that we keep talking about? So um, let's revisit the prediction at the test time. So for a very general model, when we want to talk about the prediction, we are assuming that there's a function that goes from x, your input, however uh, complicated your input is, x is, and you want to predict y. And there are some shared parameters that are shared across your model. So that theta can be, for example, if uh, you have multi-dimensional features and you want to predict output, theta can be parameters of these uh, uh, polynomial functions. And this is shared across them. So this is sample 1, sample 2, and sample n. And you are given a new data set, x star, and you want to predict y. So let's just start uh, with, with this. So, so let's say that we are only interested in, in the behavior, uh, in, in the prediction of y star given x star, given all of the data that, data set that we have. So very obviously, this uh, uh, predictive posterior, I'm going to call it predictive posterior, because this is not something that you use during the training. And you want to, train, uh, you want to predict it after you, you train your model. And this is your data set. So this is why it's predictive posterior. So this is going to be proportional uh, using base rule. So this, hopefully, people can see that why it's proportional to this. It's just like basically using the base rule and getting rid of the, uh, of the denominator. 
So, so far it's clear. This part is clear to people. That is why it is proportional to this. Or not yet. Okay. So, well, I have to compute this uh, uh, this value, this, the, the, uh, the right hand side, the, the first and the right hand side. But I haven't started incorporating my, my model. So let's integrate, let's plug the theta in and integrate that out. So this, is, this becomes equal. So the advantage of playing with this object is that I can start using the model that I have, whatever however complicated that model is. So hopefully this part is clear to, to people that why we, we use it as a proportional to this model, which is basically marginal likelihood given the new data set, and integrating the theta out. So, whenever you have this joint distribution, now you can use the structure of your graph called model and expand this term and start integrating that model out. So, what should I write instead of this? Given this model, what should I write? Y is the space of all of these y's, y1 to yn, and care the x is x1 to xn. That's the notation that I'm using. So, what is this given this graph on mall? So yes, so should theta is independent, so it's gonna be P T theta. It's gonna you'll have a bunch of conditionals, so it's gonna be P multiplication of Px1, Py1 condition on X1 and theta 2, and similarly for that. So Yn condition on Xn and theta and so on and so forth. Right? And also at the end, X star condition on y star condition on x star and theta, right? Okay. So let's plug that in and see. Um, so x star would be observed here. X star is observed, yes. So you are we are assuming that you have trained your model, so now somebody is giving you new x and says that give me the x and y star. So this is basically this is coming from your uh, graph plot model. As you mentioned, all of your training data prior of the parameters and the test, conditional of the test. Now you have to con you, you need to integrate this theta out. So the and as you see, this term is basically proportional to the posterior, right? If I divide this with the marginal likelihood, which is basically P of B, I'm going to get the posterior. Now, what you can see is that basically your predictive likelihood is equivalent of doing this. This is equivalent of computing expectation of this likelihood of the, of the test data with respect to the posterior of the data. So what you can view it is that for data x, the data set from x1 to xn, I'm going to compute my posterior. I'm somehow rep I'm going to represent it. Either I'm going to represent it in MCMC, which is the sample from posterior, or I'm going to use variational, for example, inference to have a parametric form for that. And whatever uh, choice of the approximate inference that you choose, and then when somebody is giving you now given x, predict y for me, you can compute this expectation. Right? You can see the expectation with respect to the posterior. So what um, non-parametric does is that it says, why not, if, if this is the only thing that you are interested in, computing uh, this conditional, con computing this conditional, given the data, the new data set, let me com compute the, the joint distribution and all of this data set. And at the end of the day, I have to integrate, integrate out the theta why not integrating out the data in graphical model and make everybody connected? So instead of working with the structure of the graphical model, let's directly go and model this. Hopefully you see that by going after this term here, we are making our problem more complicated because all of these after integrating data out, all of these guys are going to be connected, right? But the idea of the, of the non parametric model is that Let's make a parametric, make, let's make a form for this term because if all you care about is prediction, why not you, you go after this 
and get rid of all of this intermediate inference that we have to do. If this, yes. So this, uh, increases the size of the factor that's in the small So if, so I'm not, I didn't draw all of this intermediate connection, but you can see that these y stars were connected to everybody, right? Because theta was at the top, you, you get rid of it, and then now everybody is connected to everybody. So yes, your peaks are complicated. And, but at the end of the day, so you may say that computing posterity is not easy too. And at the end of the day, if I only care about prediction, why should I do all of this intermediate layer? Let me go after this term directly. So and this is the, the idea of the non-parametric model, that instead of starting from the model, it says that if only things that you're, you care about is prediction, I'm going to go after the joint distribution of the test and the new data, given condition on the, on the input. So we are going to see some examples on how it works in reality. So let's start with very simple linear model. So I'm assuming extremely simple case that I have uh, target Y and input X. And this input x is passing through some feature extractor. So this fun the feature extractor, I'm going to call it phi x. So if you're using, for example, using images, let's say that you have some sort of like a filter that extracts features from the image. If you're using the genome, so you, let's say that you have some procedure that passes through that and extract a multidimensional uh, vector. So whatever that you have is your procedure. So your procedure that x passes through and extracts some vector of features. And I'm thinking about the like, simplest case possible. There is no noise. Uh, let's say for simplicity that um, I want to predict y, which is a scalar, from the features, and the w is my weight. It's the source of randomness, because I'm only interested in model and the conditional, is coming from my w that has some sort of a prior. For simplicity, let's assume that that's normal distribution. What dimension of normal distribution with mean zero and variance sigma uh, sigma w. Is the setup clear? Is the simplest regression case possible without any notes? Yes? That's the regression problem. No. So I'm modeling y condition on x. I'm assuming that w is independent. Right? And I'm assuming the simplest possible things ever. So you have a regression that give me some bunch of features, I want to predict y. So phi x is multidimensional, so let's say 10 dimension. And w is going to be also 10 dimension. It's going to be the, the parameters of your weight. So, OK, the setup here is just a simple regression. I have set of feature vectors that maps x, which is d-dimensional, to d-prime dimension. And the parameters of my regression is coming from normal distribution with the zero mean and sigma variance. So for simplicity, let's just say for one dimension. So let's say that somebody has given me this data set, it's just two dimension, uh, one dimension, x to y. And based on the choice of the feature set that I have, for example, if I use linear feature, which is basically phi x is going to produce x plus some uh, intercept, is going to be space of all linear functions depends on how, how I choose the w, right? You see that? So if my input feature is simple x, by changing w, I'm going to model all kinds of linear function. If my phi function is ordered two polynomials, so it's going to be x squared, x, and 1. I'm going to model all of these uh, uh, quadratic functions. So with changing w, I'm going to cover all kinds of uh, quadratic functions in this space. Hopefully, this is clear. Uh, yes? No, I did not assume any independence. Yeah, but, but here they're not they're not open. But you, you why do I need to uh, for them to be open? Uh except maybe But what do I need it? All I need is that I want to be able to cover a space of all 
quadratic function, right? All I need is, you're, you're right, that x squared and x are not orthogonal to each other. But space of all quadratic can be order two, order one, and intersect. They don't have to be two orthogonal. Here or with the, with the, with the bar now, why do you say it? But I'm saying I don't need it. It's going to be x squared plus x squared. Now it's not going to be right? x squared. Let's say I, my new, so this Here's is an example. Let, let's say I, I make it like this. This is not orthogonal. It is. In the space of polynomials, it is orthogonal. You cannot set. Uh, oh, right, yes. You cannot mix x squared with x. But I'm saying that let's, let's make this something which is not in orthogonal. Let, let's say that I'm, I'm going to make it like x squared plus x. And whatever it is, it doesn't have to be orthogonal. It just has to be covered the entire series. All it needs is that it, has, it shouldn't be nonlinear. It shouldn't be collinear. It doesn't have to be orthogonal. It's just basis, right? Some basis function. It doesn't have to be OK. Now, many of these uh, problems, we don't really care about the direct way of building y from x. We only need to have some sort of a smoothness. So a smoothness meaning that x, if x and x prime are similar to each other, we expect y and y prime to be similar to each other. For example, if I'm given a point here, and somebody tells me that given this x, predict the y, I do expect that because this point is between these two other points, the, I, I expect the y to be somehow in between. While if I'm given some point which is further away, the, the variance of my prediction of the y is, is further away from each other. So in many of these problems, all we need is to assume some sort of smoothness. Smoothness meaning that with some measures of similarities between x's, y's should be similar to each other. So in this context, how can I encode this? So what would happen, so if, if you remember the, the, the setting that I had before, that I had x1 through xn and some theta that, that, that was on the top, and I integrated out, and everybody gets uh, connected to each other. So let's just start with the same recipe and integrate w out. At the end of the day, what I'm interested in is that I'm interested in modeling this conditional. So let's, this conditional is going to, it is equivalent of getting rid of all of those theta, but in this case, theta is equivalent to w. So let's integrate theta out. To do that, I'm going to introduce some notation. So let's say that whenever I use bold y, I'm talking about all of my training sets from y1 to yn. And when I'm talking about the bold phi, I'm talking about the, the, the matrix of all of these features of phi 1 through phi. Is the notation clear? OK. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to plug that in and compute this joint distribution of the joint conditional between all of the, X, all of the y's and all of the x's. So what do you expect this conditional to be? What is What kind of distribution does it be? Remember, phi is fixed, um, moderately, moderately conditional. So phi x is, is fixed. W is normal distribution. So y should be what? Normal distribution, right? Because the linear weight of the normal distribution is normal distribution. What is the mean? Zero, right? The expectation of the y that phi x is going to get out, the expectation of the w is zero. Right? So I can write that as, as this is the space of all of these y's. So I can write that as bold y equal to w transpo transpose bold phi, right? If I take expectation, bold phi is going to go out because I'm assuming that it's a constant, but right? I'm not modeling that. I'm modeling the conditional. An expectation of the uh, of the w is zero, right? So the mean would be zero. What would be the variance of this covariance matrix? Phi. Exactly. So this would be the distribution of the joint uh, 
conditional of all of the y's and all of the x's. Without any, without loss of the generality, I'm going to, I'm going to call this object k. So this k is a matrix of, of number of sub, number of samples by number of samples, right? And without even loss of the generality, I'm going to absorb this sigma w into the phi's because at the end of the day, I want to view phi as a as a function. So I can easily write this as a Cholesky factorization of the w or like a square root of the w, and then absorb it to an this phi and this phi. So there is no uh, there is nothing uh, changed. So less for simplicity without loss of generality. Let's assume that that sigma w that I mentioned that is just i. Or if you don't like it, you can absorb it. But anyway, so this normal distribution is basically what we call the covariance function. So this covariance function, you can view it as inner product of the features of x and xn. So you can view it as, as a gigantic matrix of the number of samples, by number of samples, that element n n prime of, of that is the, is, the, is the inner product of the features. Is this setup clear? And this is what we call the covariance function. But what is interesting is that if at the end of the day I want to model everything like this, why do I need to know phi? All I need to know is that it's some sort of a function. It's between xn and xn prime, and it should behave like a covariance. So the general idea of uh, non-parametric model is that instead of having an explicit form of feature, let's work with a function that acts like a covariance function. And let's keep this guy. And that's the general idea. So instead of having phi, we are going to go directly after k. Is the setup clear? Okay. So what kind of function this covariance should have? So this covariance function, as I told you, um, is going to uh, affect the, the function that, uh, that transform x to y's. So if you remember, the phi x, if I chose the phi x to be uh, linear uh, to, to be 1 and x is going to uh, encode all of the space of the linear function. If it is going to be a function of 1, x, and x squared, it's going to space of all of the, of the uh, quadratic function. But we, we decided to skip uh, uh, phi and go directly uh, over, over k. So this k, or uh, covariance function, is going to implicitly incorporate all of this, uh, all of this space, all of these uh, uh, nonlinearities between x and y, based on how the structure of the k looks like. An example of, of the k function is 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 couple. Of, so there are a couple of uh, examples. So I'm going to show you only uh, only three of them, which are quite popular. One of the very obvious example is going to be a linear function. So uh, so the linear function. If you remember, this covariance function, uh, if I have n samples, is going to be as, as big as a number of samples. It's going to be n by n, uh, n function. So one way of feeding that n try would be just inner product x with another sample x prime. Another ch choice for that is uh, so-called uh, square exponential, or if we are skipping the b0, it's called a radial basis function. Which basically what it does is that compute the L2 norm between two samples and it's gonna, it's gonna uh, normalize the effect of each of these features and uh, put it into exponential. Another example is so-called neural uh, network that basically you can, you can view it as sort of like a nonlinearity inside of the neural network. All it does is that, so for any pairs of the data set, you compute some sort of operation between them that I'll, I'm going to go and be more explicit about that and compute the similarities between them. So the similarities between objects can come from different uh, point of view. A, a very 
obvious and simple measure of similarity would be inner product or would be passing through some features and computing inner product or using some sort of like a nearest neighbor and, 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 uh, uh, and, and putting some sort of like a weight on that. But how do we come up with this and then uh, what kind of behavior is going to produce, is going to induce on my uh, function? For example, in this, ex in this example that I showed you, the first one, if you change the files, if, if you change the, the dimensionality of your features by B, this is not going to change because all it does is that it depends on the difference between them. So the actual coordinate of X, if you if you add a, a constant of the of the of the of, of constant vector to both of them, it's not going to change. It. While in the other one, if you add a constant to X and XY, it's going to change. So this is why the first class is called the stationary stationary kernels, and the other one's called non-stationary kernels. Do we will see that why this one is like stationary and why this one is not stationary? Because if I add a constant vector to x, here's going to change. But if I add a constant to both of them, it's going to subtract from each other. So if you come up, if, yes. I'm not sure I follow. Okay, let's say x and x prime are very small. The covariance should be very small. The covariance should be very small. Well, the covariance should be higher because they have the same point in each. So if two points are the same, the final output table should show very similar All it, all this one does is just computing the the collinearity of. It. So if two points are very similar to each other, so you can think of it as, as a vector. So this is one vector, this is another one. The two are very similar to each other, they're very collinear, right? So you can think of K as just like a measure of similarities. That's it. We call this covariance function because of what I'm going to talk about in the following slides, because let's hang on there. But for now, let's assume that it's just a similarity. So let's see some examples, see how it behaves. So let's just start with um, a no, no, uh, square exponential case. That I have a d-dimensional vector. And between these two d-dimensional vector, I'm going to scale each of these dimensions with LD, um, the, with a different uh, uh, width. And I'm going to sum them up and put it into negative exponential. So what would be the behavior of the induced function based on the parameters that I choose here? So here the parameter is going to be L because that's the degree of freedom that I have and sigma F is another parameter that I have. How would be the behavior of the function in that space? So for example, if I change the sigma F, it's going to produce a, the, 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 the type of random function that I can get from that would be if the sigma f is become very large, I'm going to get a very random function. So the, the function that has a lot of bumps. So one way of viewing that is that uh, you can view this um, if, very uh, naive way of uh, saying that, but intuitively it makes sense. You can view the sigma f as, as something that makes more rougher functions, so a function that can have uh, higher a number of, uh, of bumps. While if I reduce the sigma f to zero, it's going to produce something which, which is more like a flag. And it makes sense because if I make the sigma f almost zero, everybody is going to be, the variation between the features is going to be very similar. All of the sounds are going to look similar to each other. So it's as if I'm modeling everything with constant. But that constant is going to be average of my data sets. While if I having something which we change uh, faster, I can, I can, uh, I can incorporate uh, bigger variations. And similar to, to, the, to, the, to the length function, if I make a length function which is big, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to have many peaks. But if I, uh, if I choose something which is small, I'm, going, I'm allowed to have lots of jumps in between. 
So you can think of this as L as inverse of the complexity somehow. That with a very small L, you can have lots of peaks, while with very big F, you can have very few. Does this have something to do with the bandwidth? Like, yeah. Can... Yeah, it is basically. I guess um, in the interest of time, I'm going to just finish talking about covariance function and uh, revisit this next time. But what are the uh, parameters? Um, so if, I, uh, if you remember, we said that instead of going directly after, uh, after uh, phi, we are going to go after k. But different uh, parameterization of the k is going to induce some sort of like a phi, but implicit. There is no reason to believe that this phi is necessarily uh, finite dimensional. In fact, for some of the forms of the similarities between them, this phi function, which is implicit function, can be infinite dimensional. An example of that uh, uh, will be given in, in the following. But all you need to do in order to, cho to choose the proper phi is to make sure that it acts like a covariance function. And a covariance function, one of the behaviors is that it should be uh, positive. Difference. So how would I translate that to the space of function? Is that this is basically says that if I have, a, if I want to choose your own measure of similarity, you have to make sure that your function, your pairwise function, is symmetric, and uh, is uh, and also it produces a positive definite function. And as long as you can prove this, your you can choose your k arbitrarily. Another interesting thing about the covariance function is that you are not limited to finite uh, to, to a vector. You can basically define your uh, your similarity function between sets. You can define it between string, and you can define it between images and any complicated object. As long as you can prove your uh, kernel function is positive definite, you are good to go. So, in interest of time, I'm going to stop here and uh, revisit all of these. Uh, or part of this, again, uh, next class, which is, I guess, almost our uh, last class. So for now, we can stop. Thank you.